All right, here we go. Pierre, uh, uh -huh. welcome to Vlad TV. I appreciate you having me, man. Look forward to being here, brother. Oh, yeah, man. Longtime fan. I've been seeing you for a while. Yeah, you know, yeah. Doing movies, doing stand-up. Mm -hmm. You know, you're also doing plays, yep, you know, yep. which I didn't know about, but yep. you are telling me about. You yep. know, so you've been, you know, working and doing your thing for quite a while now. Any kind of way to bring that money in. Yeah. You know, I guess so. It is, yeah. Yeah, so I'm ready, ready to rock and roll. I got a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff I've been working on. That's what's up. Yeah, that's what's up. Or the up. book, you know. Yeah, that too. Shit. That's right. Guess, yeah. That's right. Yeah. And the book is called? My 100 Homies and Phonies of Hollywood. You can get it on Amazon if you want to. There you go. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> so your mother is German mm -hmm. and your father is black, Still American. Know. Yep. Okay. And he was in the military? Yep. Yep. And uh, where do they meet exactly? Uh, strip club. <laughs> my, my, my mother was a burlesque dancer. You okay. know? Well, in, in Germany? In Germany, yeah, yeah. Okay, so he was stationed out there. Yeah, yeah. Got it. And ain't, ain't too many niggas out there just to be out there, but <laughs> you know, unless it's an army. <laughs> they really ain't out there chilling and shit. Yeah. They take vacations yeah, out there. Yeah, like, no, sir. No, it's not sir. like Cancun. Like <laughs> if a black man's in Germany, he's in the service. Damn that. Okay. okay. <laughs> so your dad was stationed out there. Mm -hmm. He goes to a strip club. Yeah, pretty much. And he meets your German mother. Yeah, burlesque. Let's say burlesque. Let's bring it down a little bit. Burlesque. Yeah, burlesque. Burlesque club. Okay. Sounds a little classy. What's the difference between a strip club and a burlesque club? Uh, no tattoos, and she didn't drop it like it's hot. Okay. So she wore a little pasties and shit, okay? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so they met. Uh huh. They started a relationship. Right. And they had you. That's pretty much, yeah. Yep. Did either of them have other kids at the my time? Mother, my mother had a daughter, a, a one or two year old daughter. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So. They ended up having you, and then they moved back to the U.S. Right. Okay. Were right. they married or no? Yep, they got married. Oh yeah. Okay. They made it official. In Germany. No, they got married over here. Uh, you know, that's a good question. I don't remember where they got married, but I know damn sure my parents were married. Okay. So they moved back to the U.S. Uh huh. And you were how old at the time? Uh oh. No, 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 no. Let me take it. Let me take it back. They they met there, and they uh, no, they met in Texas. I'm sorry. They met in Texas, and she was working. I don't know what she was doing. But she was still German, and they had they had me. And two weeks later, they moved back. They moved to Germany, like that. My bad. Got it. And they stayed there for eleven years. And then we moved to inner city of Washington D.C. Okay, so you grew yeah. up actually in Germany for the first like eleven years of my life. Yeah. So you could speak fluent German. I need business. You know, I'm good enough to get some ass if I need some from a, from, from a young lady. You know. <laughs> okay. So what was it like <laughs> being being a mixed kid growing up in Germany? Ooh. Well, in Germany it wasn't bad. Germany was cool because you know I was around all other cultures. Mm -hmm. It's when I moved to the inner city of D.C with long flowing hair like Prince on his first fucking album. You know, you don't want to look like that going into inner city D.C. with long... I had the Beyonce before Beyonce. Let's put it that way. I look like Sean Cassidy, for those who know the fair Fawcett and shit. Okay. So I got teased mercifully having that kind of hair. I mean, I was to the point where kids, black, the dark-skinned black kids, not just dark, but the black kids would tease me about my hair so much that I wanted nappy hair like theirs. Okay, because, <laughs> you know, when you look at you, you can kind of pass for, for white and black. Easy. I got, I got the rock Vin Diesel thing going. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty yeah. much. Yeah. Pretty much. So certain people thought you were white. Uh, mm, I don't know. No, Vlad. Once you got a little bit of black in it, at least the black people thought I was black. Well, I, I mean, black. the black people know what right. mix looks like. But right. white people aren't usually as educated in this type of thing. So That's true. Yeah. Um, but now, most of the white people I was around was when I was in Germany now, 11 years old. So, you know, they let me in the house to play with their kids. So I didn't even know about racism. So I couldn't even tell you how I felt any difference. Yeah, mm -hmm. everyone played with me. Everyone let me let, come in their house. You know, it's a little military town, so it's a little bit different where I grew up. So, again, the, I only knew the difference when I came to the United States, to, Germ to uh, D.C. Okay, and it was a rough transition for you coming yeah, back yes, to it was. D.C. Yeah, I had to learn what was called joning, talking about people snapping, bagging, because I was teased a lot growing up. Okay, mm. and your parents actually got divorced. Yeah, once, yep. it, once you got back to yeah, DC. yeah. My mother didn't like it. Uh, I stayed with my, my uncle for a couple of years. Then my my mother and father came. My father had to go do some time, some some fair time in, uh, in Fort Leavenworth uh, over, over some business that uh, you know somebody brought something to the crib and left it there. And the polizai came and looking for it and blamed it on my father, and he had to do some time. So someone brought some drugs into your house. There you go. And the police found it. Yeah, the cocaine. One, yeah. The coca he, well, well, my father owned. They owned a nightclub. Okay. They lived off base. My parents did, and, mm -hmm. they, and my um, and my mother owned a club called Club Why Not, where all the soldiers would come and stuff. At the end of the club, at the end of the end of it, they had like two bedrooms where the like uh, waitresses would stay at and stuff like that. You know, a lot of them was you know doing what they did, and one of them brought some shit over and kept it over there, and it was on the property of 
you know, huh. my father's situation. So they thought he actually ransacked the house. I came, I remember I went to school one day, I came home, and you know, I came home to an empty house was just ransacked. Them, them Germans told that shit. They pulled out every fucking thing, every box, everything out, and ransacked the house. And then my father had to go and do some time. So your dad got locked up in Germany. We got, yeah, no, but you know, if you're in the military, they send you back to the United States ah. to go to Leavenworth. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah, you had okay. some time. Okay, so you got locked up in the military prison. Right, exactly. Uh, for yeah. how long? A year. And then, uh, yeah. Not too bad. Yeah, well, it, well, they found out there was, it was a little escape going. But then my father had to give up a lot of stuff. He had to give all his benefits up, man. He put, yeah, put 22 years in that time. <sighs> right, so it was so, a dishonorable discharge, Yeah, I man. Oh, I need the business, man, yeah. So, so we had to start from the up, bottom. That really messed up your whole life then. It, 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 it could have been better. I mean, my life could have been better. But my mother came. After he, you know, he got out, he came, and they, we moved to Maryland, right on the outskirts of D.C. My mother yeah. didn't like, uh, you know, the United States, so her and my sister went back to D. C., uh, went back to Germany, and it was just me and my father when I was 11, about 12 years old, and from then on. Mm -hmm. So, growing up in D.C., mm -hmm. how was it? What was, was the? It was fun. It was fun. Um, I grew up in the hood. You know, I first moved in, kind of in the, in the hood, and I enjoyed it. I, I didn't know any. I knew it was a little rougher than what I grew up with. You know, people were stealing shit, stealing, stole my bicycle and stuff like that. I didn't know you couldn't leave it out front of your house and shit, mm -hmm. you know, in the apartment, but whatever. Um, I got a quick, uh, a quick, what do you call it? I want to say tutorial, lesson of how, to, how, how hood living was, you know. Mm -hmm. It was a lot of fun, um, a lot of recklessness, you know, kids staying out to 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, um, but all the elements of, you know, hood life, I got to, uh, to learn pretty quick uh, for like a year, a year and a half. Because I moved my uncle first when my father was young. Then my father came. We moved to the suburbs of Maryland. Then it's a little back to the peacefulness of like I was. But in inner city of D.C. was a little, you know, it was fun. But um, you, had to, you know, you have to learn how to survive, man. It, it teaches you how to survive out there. Okay. Were you getting into any trouble or pretty much a good kid? Um, I was I was pretty much a good kid. The girls liked me, you know, so the guys wanted to hang with me and stuff. Um, when I was in, when I got about in, in, when I was about 20 years old, I started, well, I started hanging out with, with certain, in Maryland with some of my boys. Again, where I lived at was right across the street from D.C., so it wasn't way nice Maryland, but right by D.C., a place called PG County. And um, I hung out there a lot and uh, had my friends, and we'd do a lot of partying, hanging out. And one night, I was hanging out with my boys, and we went to uh, McDonald's. And as we were leaving the McDonald's, that little drive throughs right there, some guys were in a car, almost ran us over, kind of walked past us, and we started talking shit. Like, what's up with y'all? And they pulled over, and they were Jamaicans. They got the car. And we didn't have Jamaicans around my neighborhood at that time, so and it was kind of different. And a fight, they, they didn't want to fight us, and two of them left with a whole car, a lot of people. And the car, two cars left, two cars, two guys stayed. We started arguing. The guys came back across the street where they had parked the car, whatever they did, and opened up fire and started shooting. And I got shot three times. So I was hanging my boys. There's, you know, and I'd never heard a gun at that time. I only heard a gun from the movies, you know. But a real gun sounded like a starter pistol, like pop, pop. I thought my was, you know, I thought he had a starter pistol really until I got shot the first time. I got shot in the leg and I felt the sting and I was like, oh, this is real shit. We all started running. I tried to get back into McDonald's. They locked the door on my ass and shit. They was like, go through the drive through. Like, well, you started this shit. <laughs> Imagine literally locked the fucking door on me, man. So I'm running and stuff. The guy was shooting, pow, pow. All my friends were getting shot. Then I got shot in the back, back and I'm running, my heart beating, you know, I'm thinking, oh my God, what's, what's happening here? I still didn't really catch, capture that I was being shot. It felt like, like, like electricity. You know, it was a shocking a feel. Mm -hmm. Then I'm running, running. By the time people were ducking behind stuff, and the guy was opening up, just shooting. They shot me in the hand. My hand blew up, and all this blood and shit was hanging out. I, I damn near wanted to stop and look at the guy with the gun and say, Look, I ain't the only one out here. You can spread them bullets around equally, motherfucker. I came with a whole bunch of people now. Don't waste all of them. Shoot him. Man. Yeah, shoot him. He was talking shit too, and he was talking some shit too. Come on now. And, um, you know, after that, I kind of chilled down and just started doing comedy, you know, full time. Okay, so. Mm -hmm. And I guess these guys were the shower posse? You know, it's so funny. I'm funny, glad you said that. Let me tell you how, how, how I deduced that. So I read their book. Mm -hmm. They said that when they come into a city, there can't be two Jamaican gangs in that one little town. They'll, they'll kill each other off. They got to go find another town. Uh, that, this happened in October 87. In, in January 88, one of the shower posse members killed five guys, or five people in an apartment complex about two miles away from where I got shot at. Mm -hmm. Now you think about it. You know, how would that, how would that, it couldn't be that far, that, you know, it's the same little town. So it had to be them. You know what I'm saying? And, and the guy who did the shooting, I read about him, because I read the book, The Shower Posse, and I was like, wow, it probably was them. It had to be them. I mean, because there's no one, where I live at, there would be no Jamaicans around. You know, it wasn't, if you're in D.C., you can have some Jamaicans, but out in Maryland, there were no Jamaicans unless, we're talking about, what, 
October, November, December, three months later, mm -hmm. a, tri a quadruple murder or four, four, whatever, five murder happened. So it had to be them. I was going to write that nigga in, in jail, too. <laughs> Fuck that. I was like, dude, you shot me. Now, you gave me one of my best routines, but I, I could have did it another way. But yeah, actually, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it just started from just a, an argument? Just yeah, because they were, gonna, they were almost running us over. It's like five of my boys were coming out of McDonald's. They, you know that little drive through right there? And you had to kind of walk past it to get to the parking mm -hmm. lot. They almost hit us. So, you know, young cats, you know, you're 19, 20 years old. You're like, fuck you. What the fuck? What you? Like, you don't know, but uh, in the hood, shit can pop off real quick, bro. Yeah. A step on your shoe could turn into some, a murder. So that, you know, just almost hitting us, coming out through that drive through almost killed me. Got me killed. Did uh, anyone else get shot in that group? Yeah, a couple other friends, but not enough. Shit, I'm, I'm the one took three. Shit, they only, one of them took one, another one took one. So I'm the one took the three. Okay, yeah. so no one got killed. No, thank God. But you got shot three times. Yep. You went to the hospital? Uh, yeah. What the fuck you think? I went home? I'm glad I got down, bro. I got shot in the hand, the leg, and the back. Walk yeah. it off. Yeah, fuck that. Not with a nine millimeter. You ain't walking shit off. You got it. And it's funny because I had bought a pair of Nikes. A Ni I think it was like Nike. Not Nikes. A New Balance 575. They were like $105 back then. It was a lot of money back then. And I got blood on them. So when I went to the hospital, I got the hospital. They kept my shoe. I made them get my damn shoe back, man. I had to wash that damn blood out that damn shoe. That shoe was $105 back then. Okay. Yeah. So you get shot three times. Yep. In the hand, the back, the back, and the leg. Mm -hmm. Any permanent damage? Yeah, a little nerve, a little nerve damage on this hand. I got shot, you know, right here, right in the wrist, and blew all that up. The, the leg, not really. And I actually still have the bullet fragment in my waist, you know, my, my hip. Okay. You know, bullet fragment, yeah. How badly did that mess you up psychologically? Well, right after it happened, any loud noise like that would scare me, you know. Mm. And, and even a group of guys, if I see like four or five guys walking somewhere, I'd walk across the street, stuff like that. So right after that, um, loud noise, you know, got me shook. And, um, and uh, yeah, you know, being around a lot of guys. And it kind of, because I used to hang around my boys. We, we you know, we were kind of riffraffs and stuff, hanging out at the clubs with all the, you know, the drug dealers and just partying back then. But I started getting away from that and said, nah, that ain't, that ain't my thing. Let me, uh. Let me get into comedy. It's a little more safer. I mean, a lot of times when, when stuff like that happens, people start carrying a gun themselves. Right, right, right. Did you start doing that? No. I was only 20 no. years old, no. I got one now, though. Yeah. You know, a lot of times people start carrying guns, and True. then that escalates into all types of other stuff. True. Like, I remember uh, I interviewed Shaka Senghor. He okay. wrote a book called Writing My Wrongs. He got shot, and then he started carrying a gun, and then he ended up killing somebody. Wow. Because he, he was just so paranoid. Right, right. He didn't right. want to get shot again. Right, I feel you. I feel you. And, you know, there was a, a drug deal that started to go a bit a bit sideways. Right. And then, you know, he thought a dude was going to shoot him again. And he pulled out and killed him. Right. He ended up doing, you know, 20-something right. years. And he wow. wrote a best-selling book. Right, right, uh, Called right, Writing right. My Wrongs, which became a, a New York Times bestseller. But no, no, I didn't. I, didn't um, like, I want to get away from guns. It's you so want to get away from it all. It, funny, my friends always say, when I tell them that story, they're like, man, you a gangster. Like, no, the motherfucker shot me. He was a gangster. I was a victim. <laughs> shit. I was a victim. <laughs> I no the opposite about, of a right, gangster. Right, shit. I was the one getting shot. <laughs> shit. So, I don't know. so then you started doing comedy around 17? Mm -hmm. 17 years old, yeah. Okay, that's when you first walked into a comedy club? Yep. I first, I, I used to, uh, I went in there on an open mic night. And, and uh, well, actually, went the night before, on uh, Friday night. And a guy told me, a comic there, I said, how, you know, I said, how do you get into comedy? How do you do this? I had no idea how to do this. Eddie Murphy was hot, and, you know, I just wanted to do, tell jokes on stage. And I remember him telling me, go home and uh, write five minutes of material. Come on back on uh, amateur night. And I was like, all right. And I was driving home. I was like, what the fuck is five minutes of material? I know how to joan and snap on people. I don't know no jokes. And I remember I stole, uh, I had an album by Stephen Wright and uh, Rodney Dangerfield. And I took their jokes and switched it around the urban version, went to open mic night and killed Mm. People like, man, you funny as fuck. I'm like, this is easy to do this. But then, you know, <laughs> you know, you can't take people's jokes and stuff. And after a couple of uh, months, I wound up doing my own material. And I ran into Chappelle then. A lot of young comics was, you know, running out there. DC had a lot of good comedians. Oh, yeah, back Chappelle there. came from DC. Yeah, oh, yeah. Right. Tommy Davidson, Martin Lawrence, mm. Wanda Sykes, yeah. Teddy Carpenter, Earthquake, Donnell Rollins. Aha. Uh -huh. So yeah. all these guys yeah. were coming up around the same yeah, time. Yeah, around the same time. We all came together. Yeah. Okay. So what was your first big break after doing the comedy clubs? Um, I moved, I saw Tommy Davidson and Martin come, come here. Martin worked on, uh, I was doing a movie called House Party and Tommy Davidson was doing Living Color. So I came mm -hmm. out and I saw them on a vacation just to see how it was LA. They said, come on out. So a year later I came back, I came out here, did the sleep on the floors, all that kind of craziness. And um, a guy named Bob Sumner saw me and he was doing a st show called um, Deaf Comedy Jam. They had taped a couple of, couple of episodes, but they hadn't aired yet because sometimes you tape stuff first before you mm -hmm. air it. And he wanted to look for some new talent. He heard about me, flew out here, saw me, and then I did uh, Deaf Comedy Jam. Okay, was that the first season? Yep, first season with Martin. Uh, yeah, Martin Lawrence was the, mm -hmm. was the host. Was the host yeah. Hell of a host, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah, man. He was, he, was, <laughs> he was killing it. He was killing it. 
yeah. killing it. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. That's the thing about these these uh, comedy shows. Mm-hmm. A lot of times, the host is really what. Oh yeah, it keeps it going. What really it ties it all together. If a comic falters on the show, you got to bring it back up. You know, you got to be a good host, and he was. I mean, he was perfect for the show. I think he was probably the greatest host I've seen. Yeah. Do you know actually that wasn't for him? That show was not for him. Who was it for? Robin Harris. Hmm. It was for, Robin Harris was going. They wanted Robin Harris to host it. But when he died, they were looking for somebody. And they were thinking about Damon Wayne. They were thinking about Arsenio Hall. But they talked to Eddie Murphy. And he said, you should look at Martin Lawrence because he was doing that movie Boomer- Boomerang with him at the time. Mm-hmm. And that's how Martin got the job. So you're doing Def Comedy mm-hmm. Jam, which has really gone down as the biggest you know, source platform. of, the biggest platform sure. of finding new urban talent. Sure. Of all time. No, you're, to without this a day. Doubt. Without a doubt. To this day. Yeah. I mean... I remember I interviewed Russell Simmons. Mm-hmm. And we talked about that. How he was basically saying how, you know, the black community community already knew about all these guys. Right. These guys were all already high. Right, right. You right. know, to black people, but like the you know America just didn't know about them. There so it was go. just easy. Like all these guys were ultra talented. Right. Sure. What we did with Martin and Jamie and Bernie and Chris Tucker and Dave Chappelle and Steve Harvey and Cat Williams and you know Kevin Hart and all those people they were underserved and under exposed and Hollywood didn't see them. They would pick the more accessible, easy to digest comedians. But the big stars came from Edge and, and, and this cultural space that, that Hollywood doesn't see well. And so that's how they became famous, deaf comedy. Chris Tucker to Dave Chappelle. Steve Harvey, to, Harvey Cedric. Steve Harvey, Cedric. Uh, mm-hmm. Deal Hughley. Do, do you know? Yeah, of course. He did the same All thing. All these guys. Mm-hmm. So you're coming in with all these guys. Yep. Was that a game changer for you? Yes, yes. I mean... I mean, I remember I went, I used to work at the bank, you know, I was, I was a, in fact, I was a teller, so I had to go back to working at the bank. I did Def Comedy Jam, I had to go back to work at the bank, because Def Comedy Jam didn't pay but $832 <laughs> after taxes, was like $622.48, so I had to go back to work, you know. But I mean, people coming in, couldn't believe I worked at the bank. They were like, real brothers coming in, whoa, hell, what the hell are you doing at the bank? You was on Def Comedy Jam last night, what the hell are you doing at the bank, man? What the fuck are you doing? I'm like, what? And I was like, man, get to the other, and they would actually wait in line for me. Like another teller was like, teller number four. They're like, no, nah, I'm waiting for my man from Def Comedy Jam. Fuck that, I want him to do my check. You know, deposit my check. I was like, motherfucker, you got a $38 check. What you doing with cable, motherfucker? <laughs> Fuck out of here. But it, yeah, I felt embarrassed. But it did. It did. I, I started working way more, you know, way more. Um, remember, I was on the third show ever aired. Third, fourth show. Fourth, fourth show. The fourth show ever aired. So okay. it was before Chris Tucker, before Jamie Foxx, for a lot of other people who mm-hmm. got on it. Yeah, um, to be on the fourth show was huge. And that was hot, hot then. I mean, people would literally not leave the house until after Def Comedy Jam and, you know, on a Friday night. And then they would go to a club. Yeah. Clubs would get packed after 12 o'clock. So it was that hot. So I started traveling and doing shows all over, man. Loved it. It was a blessing. So at one point, you decided to start pursuing movies. Yes. And BAPS was yep. your first movie. Yep, sure was. The first How, how'd you get that role? Um, I used to be at the comedy club, a place called the Comedy Act Theater um, in Crenshaw. And Robert Townsend saw me. And he, uh, he's one why I'm direct, he directed the movie. Mm-hmm. And I remember him telling me, he said, man, I got something for you, man. I got something for you. I'm like, all right, cool. So he would come out and see me again or come out and see other comics. I would see him. He's like, I got something for you. After a while, I was like, yeah, I'm going to rob you. You ain't got shit for me. You know, after, you know, like six months of it. And then one day he, um, he said, uh, on, it was on a Sunday. I always remember. He said, come down to uh, the Beverly Hills Hotel. I, got, I want you to meet somebody. I want to talk to you. And when Robert Townsend called, you come. Mm-hmm. And I remember going down there. And, um, and that was funny was, I used to do the warm-ups. I used to be a warm-up comic, warm-up the audiences for TV shows. I did um, In the House with LL Cool J and The Fresh Prince. Mm-hmm. I was doing um, The Fresh, I think maybe In the House, and when, when, you're, when, you're, when, you're, when you're doing you're doing like on stadium seating. You know, the seats go up. And so if you stand right here, the first row, you can't really see their faces because they're, they're chest high. Everyone's goes up. And there was a chick, two girls sitting there. One was a little heavy set, and one had a baseball hat on. And she was cute. Heavy set, one was cute. I said, look at you, looking like Halle Berry's sister. <laughs> you know, just joking like that. And when, when I was finished taping, they got up, and it was Halle Berry with the baseball hat. I was like, oh, <laughs> shit. I didn't know it was her. So when I came to the Beverly Hills Hotel, uh, Robert Townsend had an assistant named Charlie, a female named Charlie. And she came out and met me in the lobby and said, look, Halle Berry's in there. Don't get all excited. You're going to meet with her. I'm thinking, oh, shit. I just clowned her friend and she, like a week ago at the taping. I think, oh, I hope she don't remember me. And we sat down in the booth, and they just asked me questions and, you know, just about my life and whatever. And I'm thinking, and that girl was there. It must have been her assistant was there. And, you know, Halle was really cool. And um, I left, and nothing was said. Like, all right, well, thanks for coming by. I'm thinking, what the fuck was this about? And about a week later, he called me and said, you got a part in, um, in BAPS. And I remember asking him, I said, how'd you know I was going to be good for BAPS? You know, how's, I never acted. I didn't audition for you. 
He said, if you wasn't during audition uh, rehearsal, we got rid of your ass. <laughs> I was like, damn. So that was my first film ever. Right. And you got to understand that during that time, Holly Berry was like the baddest Oh, come female. on, son. Come on, man. Period. Come on, Vlad. She was the baddest. Yeah, and she was. She was. I'm going to tell you a little story. Now. I don't tell too many people this, but I was married. You know, I was married at that time. Mm -hmm. I just had a daughter. And what happened was Robert Townsend wanted me and Holly Berry to hang out a lot, you know, okay. before we started filming. So we had synergy on screen. So, you know, we exchanged numbers, and um, me and Holly went to a coffee shop. We hung out a little bit. We got, got, got we getting to know each other. And I was going like, damn, Holly liking me because Holly picked me, actually. So, you know, I was thinking maybe I might have to go, you know, push up on Holly, you know. Now, I know I was married, but fuck it. If you're going to cheat, you might well cheat up. My wife was cool as hell, but come on, she wasn't Holly. <laughs> cheat up. Yeah, well, you know, man, I was like, baby, you got to take one for the team now. Man, I'm slinging this dick Holly Berry. Yeah, I'm trying to help us out, you know, trying to get us in a better situation. Take one for the team this time. Don't be so selfish, damn it. But... <laughs> Ah, but uh, so I was holl so I was like, we was getting together. She was feeling me. The vibe was really good. I was like, oh my god, I think I might get this. And she was going through a divorce with Dave Justice, so she uh -huh. was kind of vulnerable. You know, she needed a shoulder to cry on. And you know, I'm from D.C. I got two shoulders, but you know, we want to and shit. So one day I had a re uh, we had to go to rehearsal, and uh, she uh, I didn't have no money for a babysitter, so I had to bring my daughter. My my daughter was in the car seat, so I had to bring her to my rehearsal. Mm -hmm. So I brought her to the rehearsal, and I get up there, and Holly sees my daughter. She says, oh my god. She said, oh my God, you have a baby? I didn't know you had a baby. She said, uh, how's your daughter? I said, she's uh, six months old. And Holly looked at me and said, six months old? She, said, she asked me, she said, are you married? And Vlad, have you ever tried to say yes and no at the same time? <laughs> I'm like, am I married or is my wife married? What you asking me, Holly? Fuck it. What, what, what the fuck are you asking me? Because as you can see, we separated. She ain't around me, Holly. You know what I'm saying? We're going through consultation. And I don't think we're going to counsel. I don't think we're going to make this work. But um, Holly was like, nah, I'm good. And she kind of separated from me. I was like, fuck. I was like, damn. And I look at my daughter, sometimes I think, damn, if I could just kept my daughter in the car for like two hours and crack the window, you know, we could have a better situation, you know. It would have been a two hours. It wasn't that hot that day. It was only like 79 degrees. She could have hung out there. She was six months old. She didn't know no difference. Yeah. Right. Uh, you might be in prison right now. Yeah, but whatever. You know, hey, yeah, well, you know, it's but, Holly Berry. Oh, I could be Holly Berry's baby daddy. Shit. Come on, player. Come okay. on. Think, think positive, man. Think positive, brother. Okay. <laughs> so you do BAPS. Okay, yep. Yeah. And then you end up doing... How to be a player. Yeah. The same, they had the same producers. Okay. They brought me in um, to audition for it. Um, and I killed the audition. And they were like, all right, you know, you got that part too. So right after that, I started filming um, How to Be a Player. Right, with Bill Bellamy. Bill Bellamy, yeah. AJ, uh, Ezel from Friday and all the rest of them. Right. Then you also did uh, 2001 A Space Travesty oh, with oh, Leslie man. Nielsen. Leslie Nielsen, man. That's an old school dude right there. Naked Gun. Yeah, you, remember, you remember him? Yeah, Naked yeah, Gun. Yeah, of course. Well, what pissed me off was... I was I was played this I played this sidekick in the movie and I thought be the hip sidekick, but you know he's about what seventy five years old at the time. Now we we did it over in Europe we did it in, we did it in uh, we filmed that in where we filmed that in we filmed that in Montreal and in Munich Germany and they love him over there they are crazy about that kind of comedy he do that slapstick mm -hmm. kind of comedy and I remember I was trying to be hip in my movies I was trying to be funny with, you know in the movie with him and trying to do funny things and say funny things. And he kept wanting to stop me, like, no, don't do it like that, don't do it like that. I'm thinking, motherfucker, that's, that's, what we, that's, what, that's what the hip is, the kids are doing now. And I asked him, I said, you know who Chris Tucker is? You know, he did not know who Chris Tucker was. <laughs> I'm like, you know who Martin Lawrence is? He's like, no. I said, motherfucker, no wonder you ain't getting this shit. And I remember I did this, I was doing this big scene with all these monsters and all this kind of craziness. And when I got done, some extra came to me. He's like, I, I like it, you're a funny comedian, but you, you're, not, you're not doing funny stuff in here. And that shit crushed me, man. That guy told me I wasn't doing funny shit in there. Uh, extra. I'm like, fuck, you can notice that because my lines were really bland because he didn't, Leslie didn't want me to, you know, you know, be too crazy and, um, uh, about it. Um, and I remember this, I remember this too, the story. Um, so we filmed it, then they did, sometimes they do reshoots in a movie. You know, they bring back, they bring you back and do reshoots. And we did a reshoot, but they wanted to put me in a Ku Klux Klan outfit, you know, and the reshoots here, right? <laughs> okay. Klan, like the, the hood and all that shit. And I was like, oh, nah, son, we ain't doing that. You know, and, but they wanted me to be a fool. Like, I put the fall in a laundry chute, and they come up with the laundry on it. Like, well, I don't know what I'm running around this theater with everyone, all these people not knowing I had a Clans outfit on. They're like, don't you know what you got on? Like, what? Uh. And I was like, nah, man, I ain't gonna do that, homie. I ain't doing that. And they tried to get me out of the trailer. They, they, I stood in there for like two and a half hours. They're like, you know, they started talking about, we're gonna get this role of Marlon Wayans and shit. You know, we gave it to you. I'm like, yeah, well, you didn't give you, It wasn't in the script about the Ku Klux Klan. You, you wrote that in at the end. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't gonna do it. I said, no, nah, man. And they hounded me and they hounded me. I said, well, the only way I'll do it if I get to say, Slicker lines because I thought about Richard Pryor in a movie Bustin' Loose. I think it was Bustin' Loose, and he had a Ku Klux Klan outfit on. He made the Klan take, take this, this this bus out of his mud, and I said, "Well, okay, I can wear it, but don't I don't want to be a buffoon wearing it." But I almost, you know, I think I gonna say I got blackball behind that, but they were the producers was pissed at me. But I was hmm. like, "Y'all, you can't add something into a script later on and make somebody do it." 
they don't want to do it. That's fucked up, man. Well, yeah, and as an actor, I mean, you have to have your, uh, you know, the limits of what you'll, you know, what you want to do. For example, like uh, I interviewed DeAndre Bonds, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. and uh, he had a scene in um, what's it, lock. Hold on, one lock, lock that lock up. Yeah, yeah, lock, lock, yeah, yeah. That was yeah. I think I remember where, that. where he got yeah. raped. Right, right. Uh huh. And uh, he didn't want to do that scene. Right. And uh, after the scene was shot, he went into his uh, trailer and cried. Right, right. And to this day, he regrets doing that scene. Lockdown had a rape scene mm -hmm. that, that you were in. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess you didn't want to do it. The, the, the rape scene? Yeah. No, I did not want to do it. I, that's one of the worst scenes I ever did. And I wish I could go back and take it back, you know what I mean? But. You know, I was an actor, I'm an actor at the time, and the director, you know, said, you, I need you to do this, man, you know, and like, fuck it, come on, man, let's just get it out the way. I guess you cried after yeah, doing that scene. Yeah, I cried. Literally, like, because I felt like I, I didn't feel right, you know what I mean? It was just something that wasn't spiritually right about that shit. And I didn't see what it needed to be in the movie for. But, you know, I wasn't the writer of the movie, and I agreed I was under contract. Yeah, I guess as an actor, you can't just start changing the script. No, nah, you can't. Not once you sign. I would have a problem with Like, I get that. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Because I'm, I'm really fenced. Like, I've already talked to some people about guys wearing dresses, you know. Right, right that's right. a common theme right. on flat TV. But my thing is this. I have no problem with an actor wearing When you're an actor to wear a dress, I have no problem with that. Now, because... You're gonna, you know, I know how, how some brothers be like, man, I would win no damn dress. I wouldn't win no damn dress. Yeah, but you'll play a murderer, a pimp, a killer, a drug dealer. You'll play all those negative stereotypes, but if you wear a dress is too much, nah, son. You, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see that. I say, look, if you don't wear no, ne if you don't do no negative um, portrait of a black person, I'm fine when you say I ain't wearing a dress. And then what you're saying, you're not wearing a dress, is what means what? You have a problem with homosexuality? Is that the problem? You don't like homo, gays, you know? Is that what it is? Let's go to the root of the problem. Is that what the problem is? But I can't see somebody like Denzel Washington play a bad cop or Wesley Snipes, you know, he wore the dress, which was cool and too wong fu, but, mm -hmm. you, you know, beating black women up or shooting, well, anybody selling drugs to black people, shooting a whole room full of black people up, you're cool with that character? Like, man, that's my, part, that's my character right there. But wearing a dress is too much? Nah, son. Nah, bro. I, I, I don't, I don't, you know. So I, I don't have a problem wearing a dress. I'd wear a dress and kiss my ass about this shit. All the <laughs> okay. greats wore dresses, shit. So you ended up being in the Tupac music video, uh, yeah. all about you. Yep. How did you and Tupac end up linking up? I got a call from uh, my homegirl named Tracy. She was producing a video, uh, uh, all about you video, mm -hmm. all about you video, and she said Tupac wants you to be in the video. I'm like, okay. I didn't know he knew who I was. So, uh, you know, I told her my price, and she went for it. I was like, Ooh. well, then she told me the price. I'm sorry. She told me the price. I said, damn, a lot of pretty good money. So I said, I'm damn sure going to do it. So <laughs> I went on the set, and I remember uh, I saw Tupac. He was excited about seeing me. Oh, man, you're my man. And he was with the outlaws at the time, hanging around him. He said, oh, uh, oh, he's all, you know, excited. They always want me, he always wanted me to make him laugh and shit. Everything I said, I could tell him anything. They start laughing. I'm like, I'm about to use the bathroom, y'all. <laughs> He's about to go to the bathroom. <laughs> I'm like, calm your ass down, Pac. Come on. I'm going to get a soda. He want a soda. This nigga say he want a soda. I'm like, good Lord. So I remember he um, kept laughing and stuff. And I asked him one day, I said, I asked him one day, I said, why'd you pick me? How'd you get me? And he said he actually saw me on BET Comic View in prison and thought I was funny in prison. And that's how he went out and asked me. And he came to my trailer. I'm sitting in my trailer and he comes to me. And I'd seen, we were shooting a video. And he wore like uh, he wore some suits. He had kids in it and stuff. And he even had the rugged look of Timberland boots and baggy pants. And I asked him. I said, "Yo, man, I'm an East Coast cat. I said, "Why wasn't you? Uh, why aren't you rocking the Timberlands and the, the what's thing?" And he told me right then and there. This is during the height of the East Coast West Coast beef. He said, "I'm getting tired of this whole East Coast West Coast thing." I was like, "Wow, really?" He said, "Yeah, man." He said, "That's why I want to change my image up. I want to, you know, show I'm with kids and wear suits and I don't just had a thug look about him." I was like, "Wow, that's pretty interesting." And my video. Was you know because Suge made him do a lot of videos, a lot of movies back to back. Because they remember he was out on bail, he wasn't free and stuff. You know he wasn't totally free because he still had to face some charges, and they didn't know if he would get time, so he wanted to make enough material so it could last a, a while if he had to do five years or whatever the situation was. And um, my video when he died was the last video they released. Suge did not want to release that video because it was too you know kids and fun and all that. He didn't want that image and stuff. He wanted other images out. Right, because you're uh, you're basically his assistant, I guess. Yeah, in the in oh. Uh, 
in a video, I'm his friend. His friend? Yeah, that wants to come to a party. Yeah, come, you know, chase, trying to find a party. How to get to a party. Right. A party his, yeah. And you're just kind of running around. Right, and, trying to find a, uh, get into the party, uh, yeah. Were you guys in the scene together? Yeah, where, 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 where. <laughs> I guess, I guess, I, well, you know, if he's on the stage, I don't know, was he really? That's a good question. Yeah, because there's, really there's a bunch wasn't. of cut scenes with right. him just by himself. Right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah, I guess we weren't. But we were, I remember him being on the studio. I got pictures of me and him together, but okay. we weren't in the scene together. When he was doing the performances, I wasn't in that. Yeah. So it was, about, it was more about me trying to come see that performance, I guess. And your boy was in it, Theo. Remember Theo? Theo, uh, yeah. yeah, from the radio. Yeah, yeah, from the Bay Area. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and that video came out after he died? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. But that was, see, that's kind of yeah. weird because yeah. that that... That was on the All Eyes on Me album. Okay. Which had already been out for a while. Machiavelli came right. out kind of after, right sure. after he sure. died. Or wow. it, was, it was really like close to the time. So they were still releasing songs, out, videos right. off of that first album. That Suge didn't want that video out. That's what it was. Yeah, he didn't want that video. Because the next video when he died came out. Remember he did the one where he was in, saw the famous people when he's dead and stuff in the white suit? And, uh, I can't remember Thug that Mansion? Not remember. I don't remember. No, remember it was. I ain't mad at you. Yeah, I ain't mad. At me. Yeah, yeah, that that one. Yeah, yeah. We did it. Okay. He did that. He did that video the day before mine started. You know, he ended the day before uh -huh. I filmed mine. So look how close that was. And that came on right when he died. Cause uh -huh. it looked like he was in heaven and all that. Mine took a long years later to come out. You know, because of that. Right. And uh, the video that came out had Top Dog in it. Oh, okay. Which I guess was like right. an artist that Shook signed right, after right, Snoop sure. and all them had left. That kind of right. sounded like Snoop. So it was. Right. Cause I don't, you know, I hadn't, I hadn't actually seen the video until just recently. Cause it, the it one just, I was with? Yeah, because okay, I'm yeah. saying, it, it didn't come out right. traditionally. It was just You're sort right. of thrown out after the fact. Okay, yeah. anything uh, crazy happened on stage, you know, while you well, know doing all this? Any interactions with Tupac that you, you really uh, no, remember? No, I, I didn't remember seeing a red Lamborghini being brought on set with a red bow. Um, you know, I didn't, you know, as a as his birthday gift, a sugar gave him. And um, I didn't realize at the end of the day, man, Sugar owned all that stuff, man. You know, it was all his. Yeah, yeah, it was all his stuff to him. I was like, wow. You know, um, I remember the night, like in, he died in September, early September. I remember the, like in August, I was at the comedy store because he used to love to go to come to the comedy store. He used to have a thing called Fat Tuesday where all black people would come to the, the comedy so, store. So, Joe, uh, Joe Guy Tory. Guy Tory. Yeah, Guy Tory spot. And um, Gaddafi, who was one of the members of uh, The Outlaw, mm -hmm. came up to me. And was like, I was outside. He said, yo, Pac want to see you, man. Pac want to see you. And I was like, all right. So I walked inside. And he was in the middle of a big old crowd of like tables, but like closer to the stage. I couldn't really reach there. And he was like, come on, man. That's when Cristal was popular. And I don't really drink. He's like, come on, Cristal. I mean, come on, have someone sit with me. I was like, nah, I'll catch you another time. And it was never another time. You know, like two weeks later, he got shot and killed. Yeah, man. Yeah, it's crazy, yeah. And you know what's funny? When he got shot, a lot of people still thought he going to be all right. You know, when I'm, ah, he got shot before, he's going to be cool. Right, because he got shot before. Yeah, exactly. He was all right. <laughs> Shit, you know, he's like me, you know, we take them bullets to keep it moving, but right. unfortunately, no. So then you were in the video for Dr. Dre's uh, Been There, Done, done that. that. Yeah, Been There, Done That. I taped him right around the same time. Like, literally, maybe about a week, two weeks later, I got a call from somebody saying Dr. Dre wanted me in, to be in the video. I'm like, all right, cool. And... um uh, I was like, all right, but I was afraid to tell Dre I just did Tupac's video because you know it was you know well, beefing. Well, yeah, of... Pac was dissing Dre, right? Exactly. Calling him gay and yeah, everything else that like that. Stuff. Yeah, Man, he he paid me, so I'm uh, Dre was cool with me, <laughs> shit. Like that. Um, but he called me, and um, again, he saw me doing comedy and liked me from the comedy circuit, so we did the video. And I remember hanging out with him, and he told me he's like. Uh, how he got rid of, got out of, you know, being around Suge. He gave all the masters away. So I gave him all the masters. I ain't want nothing to do with the shit, man. I gave him all. I was like, wow. You know, a lot of people don't know, but masters the most important thing you want to have. And oh, yeah. recording, that's, that's the main meat. Well, you're you talking know? about the chronic. Yeah, exactly. He gave <laughs> Doggy style. Uh, he said. Uh, dog food. Oh, all, yeah, exactly. Uh, I'm trying to think what other albums came out. During, I mean, and he was working on All Eyes on Me mm -hmm. during that time as well. So you're talking about a massive collection. Can you? He you walked. Got, yeah, he walked away from all that. Think about why he walked away. You got that's a lot of money to walk away from. You know, you got to really to say fuck it. You have it. You know, sure. He didn't want to be bothered with. He wanted to start his own shit over again. I gotta give him props for doing that. That's not easy to get that kind of money. We're talking about you. You probably know hundreds of millions of dollars. Yeah. To easy. say no to walk away from. So you know, but he's like, yeah, man. I, I just gave him all the shit. I said, fuck it, man. I'm starting my own thing called Aftermath, and that was the first song off. Of Aftermath. Right. Yeah. Been there, done that was the first single. 
mm-hmm. off of Aftermath. And I remember the song was kind of cool, but then mm-hmm. the album came out and it was like, eh. Yeah. I mean, for Dre standards, because I think it probably went gold or platinum, but for Dre standards, right, sure. this was not sure. what people were checking sure, for. Sure, sure. And, and, and the whole thing, sorry no, to interrupt, no, no, no. interrupt you, but like, I think the whole vibe of that album with that song, Been There, Done That, was like, well, I'm not doing gangster shit anymore. Mm. You know, I, I'm you know, I'm past that. Right, I make my point there. And, okay. and it didn't really work out. Right, right. right. They, they wanted gangster <laughs> they shit. They wanted the gangster shit yeah. from Dre. <laughs> remember, didn't he do The Firm right before that, too? It's around the same the, time. Around the same time. The Firm didn't do well either. Yeah. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Not, not his standards. To now, his you standards, know? Yeah, right. not his standards. I mean, not he might have went platinum, you know, might have went, but that yeah. was low for him. You had Nas. So, <laughs> right, well, Foxy and uh, yeah, nah. AZ. Well, not AZ. Was AZ? Yeah. AZ. Yeah, and uh, AZ was I think, on. Uh, Nature. Was it Nature too? Yeah, yeah. Some of them, yeah, them cats. Yeah. Um, yeah, but, phone, phone tap is still a classic. Right. So, so, so those, you know, he was at a, at a transitional time when he was really trying to get his ne- feet, feet back in. Thank God that, you know. The, the video was dope, man. And uh, uh, yeah. I, I remember I interviewed uh, Razkaz. Okay. And he actually took the end part, the, that beat from the end part of that video okay. and turned it into Ghetto Fabulous. Your second album. Yeah. You guys do Ghetto Fabulous, uh huh, with uh, with Mac Ten. Now, the the beat was actually the tango. It was like it was a beat from another song, right? It was the tango part of "Been There, Done That." Like in "Been the There, video. Done That." Yeah, yeah. The end of "Been There, Done That." The tango. You took that part and turned it into a whole song. Yeah. Oh, okay. Hey, you know that? I didn't know that. No, I didn't yeah, know yeah. That. Like that whole serenade, the right, ghetto right, serenade right, at the right, end. Right, right. He took that beat, you know, with the strings, right, sure. and turned it into his own single called. Ghetto Fabulous. Okay. Okay. Yeah, Rash got definitely underrated. That dude was tight. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Was there an issue with you working with both Death Row and Aftermath at the same time? Uh, I didn't let him know that. <laughs> Fuck that. I wasn't saying shit until we finished filming it. You know what I'm saying? I didn't want them, I didn't want them to know because I didn't want, you know, Dre to be like, oh, hell no, you working on Pac stuff? Oh, you can't work on my shit. So I kept it on the low, 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 you know? So, no, there was, there would be no issue if I don't bring it up. Like, so I didn't bring it up. So, no. Nothing at all. So I remember I interviewed A.J. Johnson, Mm -hmm. and he kind of had a a similar situation. He played, you know, a fake Easy e character Uh, in Dre Day. Right. And then Easy e hired him to be in Real Compton City G's, right? Was it? That's all was a diss to Dre, wasn't it? It was a diss to Dre and and Death Row as a whole. Uh, And what had happened was... Once he started filming it, Suge found out oh. <laughs> that he was kind of double dipping. In right, a way. Right. Not really at right, all, well. but you know, Suge is Suge. So Suge had a problem with it. So he basically threatened him and said that, that you're not going to do this video. So he had to go back to Easy and say, hey, man, I, I, can't, I can't do the rest of this video. Suge, Suge threatened to kill me. And he, goes, and he goes, well, listen, man, I can't, I'm not going to be able to pay you. He's like, I don't care. I did the video. I, I guess Easy seen it. So Easy called me. He like, man, you know everybody thought that was me in the video. Oh, really? Yeah. He like, man, you got to do my video to show people that wasn't me. Real Compton City G's. I'm like, no problem. So I I do Easy video. <laughs> and and in the video, the real Easy runs into the fake Easy. Yeah. And you start shaking. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. But listen, Suge Knight. Get word that I'm doing easy video. Okay. <laughs> he called me into his office. Before I, before the easy e video. Before the easy video is done. We we oh, okay. we just done half of easy video. Like we done one day of it. So oh. I have to go back tomorrow to finish it. But she called me into the office. He like, man, you can't finish that video. I'm like, what? I'm I don't have nothing against Dre. I don't have nothing against Easy. I'm a comedian. I'm trying to pay my rent. Right. You know what I mean? You can't do it. I'm like, what you mean I can't do it? He already paid me. Hmm. Should put a gun out. Bye. I said you can't do it. I won't do it. I went and told Easy. I said, man, I can't finish the video. He like, why? I said. Chug told me I can't do it. Yo, come on, man, man. You won't let that nigga punk you like, I, I can't do it either, man. You, you told Easy about the gun and everything? I told him everything. Okay. So, yeah. Like, well, what, you, what we gonna do, man? 
I know somebody that can finish the video. So I called Arnie S.J. So Arnie S.J. finished the video. He played easy. So in the first half is me, and in the second half is Arnie S.J. <laughs> there are two sleazy E's. Yeah, in the video. In the Compton City G's <laughs> yeah. video. This is some hip-hop trivia right here that nobody knows about. Yeah. Wow. So, the money so an interesting little tidbit. If you watch the real Compton City G's video, okay. AJ Johnson is in the beginning part of that video, but there's another actor. That's funny. That's actually the end part of that. So there's two easy fake easy E's right, right. in that in video, video. That's funny. because That's AJ funny. just did not want to have smoke. Yeah, with, with <laughs> with Shug Shug yeah, yeah Shug was a, Shug was a beast back then. Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you never talked to Shug afterwards after doing the the nah, Dre video. No? I never met Shug. I never met Shook. Mm, never met him. Okay, it's probably a good thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I have no problem with that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then you were actually in the wash. I did the wash. Uh, with Dre, Snoop. Snoop and, and Eminem. And Eminem. Yep, Eminem. And, yep. and everyone else. Yeah, yep, yep, yep. It's a cool film. It was cool. Uh, yeah, it was all right. Wasn't, wasn't going to win any uh, Oscars, but... Not at all. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> And plus, and plus, you know, I only had a small part in it, which actually was a really funny part. People always tease me about the. Uh, did you ever see? Did you see it, Vlad? I saw it. Yeah. Okay, so you saw my little part. Yeah. Um, DJ Pooh directed it. Right. And I was having so much fun snapping on George Wallace off off screen. You know, we were just telling that they wanted to bring more of that in, but we ran out of time. But mm. I had a little part in it. It was cool. Um, yeah, it's not one of my, uh, you know, one of my favorites to watch, but uh, it's cool. Hey, yeah, right. <laughs> there's an audience for everybody. Okay, so then. Dre ended up calling you back mm -hmm. to work on, I guess, 2001? His album, yeah. Well, right, right. He wanted me to do some skits in between. Back then, he used to do a lot of interlude skits and so mm -hmm. forth. So he called me in. My man, uh, Mailman, you know, gave me, told me where he's at. So come on, meet. So I go into the studio, and Dre is working on a song called They Forgot About Dre. He's in, actually in the booth rapping. Mm -hmm. And then I saw there was an engineer, a white guy was doing an engineer that was on the boards and stuff. And so I remember... Uh, he was telling Dre how to rap, how to do it. Like he's really precise. Like none of you guys say like this. Da, 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 da. I'm thinking, who the fuck is this white boy telling Dre how to rap and shit? But you know, whatever. <laughs> and I could hear the the playback of the song and the hook, and I could tell it was him. You know, and I was like, okay, this guy's pretty good. I was like, okay, whatever. You know, pretty good. And we're talking, and all my man Mel made crazy as shit. From uh, he wanted me to snap on him. He kept talking about, talk about him, talking about that, talking about him. I'm like, nah. He, and the guy was acting all kind of nervous. They didn't want me to say nothing. I was like, nah, I ain't gonna fuck with him. I ain't gonna leave him alone, man. I, ain't gonna leave, I don't know this engineer. And the engineer said he was a rapper. I said, oh, okay. He said, well, I worked at a, I did a show at the House of Blues recently in Philadelphia, and they booed me. I was like, yeah, because you're white. You probably ain't no good, you know, shit. You know, Snow was out at the time, Vanilla Ice was out. I was like, fuck it, you probably one of them dudes. I, I, you know, we're talking about where the roots from, brother. You probably is whack and shit, so whatever. So you told him he was whack to well, his face. Well, I didn't tell him that, but I thought it. I'll be honest with you. I was like, yeah, you know, you know, look at you, man, shit. You got blonde hair, motherfucker. What the fuck you going to do, man? So um, about three months later, a song came. My name is came on a video. I'm like, that's the dude that was in the studio with Trey working on. They forgot about Trey. Fucking Eminem. I was like, fuck. I was right. like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Who became the best selling hip hop artist yeah. of all time, I believe, or something yeah. close to it. But remember Philadelphia, y'all booed his ass. You booed him, <laughs> motherfucker. You booed him when he came to the House of Blues back then. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And none of the skits were actually used on the album. Nope. Well, we actually didn't record him. He, you know, Dre likes to do a lot of shit, but never gets it done. Believe it or not, he likes to work a lot. Of, oh, come on, do this. Come on, do this. Come on, do this. And nothing really transpired. I made a movie called um, um, For the Love of Money. I did my own little movie. And I wanted him and Snoop to play a part in it. And they was going to do it. A little quick cameo under for two hours. Sway's going to do it, but it ran out of You know, didn't have the time to do it that day. So I think a lot of times Dre overbooks himself. That's why, he, that's why probably the, the, the Chronic 2, what? Three or whatever didn't come out yet because he overbooks himself. To him. He's, you know, he's a workaholic, but he doesn't, you know, he's, he's very meticulous of what he does and takes a long time to work on one thing until he works on something else. So, yeah. Well, you continue to audition for movies and, sure. and do your thing. I mean, you, you started doing uh, plays. Mm -hmm. and then, yeah, well, yeah. A lot of plays. Black, yeah, I sure did. A lot of black plays. Uh, a lot of plays. And, you know, sometimes the more interesting stories are, are the roles that you don't get. Mm -hmm, sure, sure. And um, you actually tried out for a Quentin Tarantino film. I sure did. A movie called uh, Jackie Brown. Mm -hmm. and it's so funny. A lot, a lot of times people don't want to mention the shit they ain't get or ain't work. Fuck that. It's part of the process, man. You get some, you lose some. I got, a, I got BAPS. I think uh, Terrence Howard was up for BAPS. You know, things happen. <laughs> but I was up for a movie called uh, Jackie Brown. Um, uh, the casting director, Jackie Brown, Carmen, brought me in and... Um, 
straight straight to him to meet with Quentin Tarantino, audition front of Quentin Tarantino. And I had myself prepared too. I walked in there. I was supposed to play this character, um, like a like a little hood dude that that Sam Jackson encounters and one of his like little partners. So I come in audition, man. I had my I had my shit all ready, man. My uh, I took my hat off. I had my do rag. I had a little beeper on. Man. I had a little fake joint on. My, a little fake joint I pulled out. And Quentin Tarantino was like, "Damn, you prepared like shit. Like man, you ready already?" Within like two seconds, let's do it. And so we're doing the lines, and what we do, people don't know sometimes, you read what's called sides, which is a couple scenes or a scene or two from the movie. So maybe about six pages, seven pages at a time sometimes. And I'm reading my lines, and Quentin's playing the Sam Jackson character. And I'm smoking a joint, I'm talking to him, and I'm saying, all right, nigga, blah, blah. And then Quentin Tarantino was like, yeah, nigga this, and nigga that, and nigga. And he was doing way more niggas than was written on the page. I'm like, God damn, how many niggas on here? He called me nigga about 18 times in like a two minutes situation. But I guess he was just ad-libbing his stuff, you know. But I was like, damn. But he loved what I did. He said, man, you did great. And I could tell. Sometimes in audition, you could tell when you did really well. And I thought I had it. And um, I actually, you know, the direct casting director called me and said, told my manager, yeah, I think he got it. They didn't go to PA. And I was like, yes. And unfortunately... I didn't get it. Chris Tucker played Big Bank versus Little Bank and took the damn role. And I'm like, motherfucker, you, you in big ass movies. Why you need that low ass role, Chris Tucker? But he wanted to work with Robert De Niro and Sam Jackson. So, well, were you bothered at Quentin Tarantino using the N word around you like that? Um, I, I was shocked. I was shocked that he used it more because you usually have everyone has the proper lines to say back, mm -hmm. and he was interjecting the word nigga more than it was written, and I was just like, okay, let's go for it. Um, I'm a huge Quentin Tarantino fan. I love his movies. Um, um, so I didn't take it as a, like, he just wanted to call me a nigga. I think he just felt that was, you know, the character because it was Sam Jackson's character who's like that. And I think he just rolled with it. It just rolled with it more than I expected. Well, right, because, you know, when he directed uh, Pulp Fiction mm -hmm. and in that movie... Shit. He he dropped the the, the N, -word N word a whole bunch of times mm -hmm. with a hard R oh, yeah. and everything oh, else yeah. like that. And I remember hearing a <laughs> hearing a story about how uh, Denzel Washington mm -hmm. like ran into him at some party and just mm -hmm. like screamed at him. Oh yeah, told him not to use it. Yeah, they like him using it stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, and I remember uh, it was an interview. I think it was with Sam Jackson. Sam Jackson was like, "Nah, Quinn's not a, a racist. He was trying to go for like a black exploitation sure. feel sure. for that movie, sure. and that's how the white people were speaking during that time. Sure, sure. but he's not racist." Sure. And, you know, there's different ways of uh, looking at it. It's a fine line when it comes to art to me, man. You mm -hmm. know, it's different than someone just saying it on the street and, and opposed to art. Yeah. Um, art is an imitation of life, but I don't think life should always dictate art. I know it sounds weird. You know, I, I think you should have a, a little bit of leniency of, as an artist, man. You know, because we, 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 we're in the realm of fiction, you know. Um, mm -hmm. um, you know, Quentin Tarantino, I mean, Mark, what was it? Jackie Chan and, and Chris Tucker are not policemen. They're not L.A. cops. Mm -hmm. You know, so we got to suspend the real, they're not real people. So why can't we suspend it when it comes to that? Um, you know, if, if, it, if, it's, if it's meant to be in that role, sure. You know, then, then, then do it. I mean, I don't, I don't have a problem with it. I don't have a problem with it. Well, uh, Dave Chappelle just dropped a new special oh, on yeah. Netflix. Oh, yeah, nice. Hell of a special. Nice. Uh, I said this is his best special since Killing Me Softly. Okay, okay. I remember at one point, uh, Faze on Love were saying that black people weren't big fans of Dave Chappelle right. early on, and you somewhat agreed with that. Right. In fact, I spoke, and, and Faze on called me up and even uh, thanked me for speaking up on it. Um, they weren't. I mean, I mean, the certain types, you know, the 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 hood or the more urbanish black people, they weren't. They weren't a fan. He even talks about like, you know, black people weren't really on him catching, you know, fire with Dave Chappelle. So I, I don't see anything wrong with what. Um, what Faison said, except he said he wasn't funny. Now, I disagree with that. Faison, like, you crazy now, Faison, you know? Chappelle but, you was know, funny. Yeah, he's funny. Killing he's Me funny. Softly was yeah. hilarious. Yeah. I mean, that that's what got him the Chappelle show. Sure, sure, sure. You know, the Chappelle show, I think, was one of the... Classic. Just one of the best shows on television, period. I, I just think, with, you know, and right now, Chappelle's at a place where... I, I'm happy that he's doing what he's doing because he's giving a voice to people who want to be, you know, expressive. That, um, you know, he, he has a platform to say, hey... We all can talk about each other, LGBTQ, you know, racism, all that. We can talk opposed to pedophilia. Whatever you feel, you know, we are an artist, you know. And he's going out there and taking that that stab for us mm -hmm. because you know he has that platform. But now, what I like about it is people who are complaining are getting overrided with that he's a genius, his brilliance. So now they're backing up a little bit, and he's in a lucky position where he's rich already. He's not making any movies. They don't have a TV show, so no sponsorship can be pulled from him. 
What the right. fuck? You know, who going to So now they shutting up and saying, like, well, okay, well, we might be a little mad at him, but what you going to do? And he's in such an envious position where my man who I love, Kevin Hart, is not like that. Kevin can't speak like that. He got too many people, too many sponsors around him. That, that's true. Tear his shit up and we'll start pulling his shit back yeah. down. I mean, when Chappelle did that joke, you know, he said, I loved uh, it. I mean, what did he say? He said, now, I'm not a pedophile, but I would fuck Macaulay, fuck right. Macaulay Culkin right. first. Right. Like, and he just went into that whole thing. Yeah. Like, you know, he's hard to catch. Like, right, 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 you know, right, right, and right. he's, I don't believe the accusers. It's like, yeah, right. someone like Kevin Hart could not pull that off. No. You're right. Oh, oh and Kevin could think that, you know, Kevin, Kevin is not just, a, some people think he's just silly and shit. He's not silly. He, he, he know, he, but he knows where, his, what his brand is and he ain't fucking that brand. Right. You're not getting another Jumanji movie yeah. after doing a joke like that. Yeah, yeah. There you go. 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 Hope he's okay. Also, you just got. Oh yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah, yeah. Well, well, you're on tour with Paul Mooney. Ah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, and a whole bunch of crazy <laughs> shit yeah. just broke. Yeah. So uh, Richard Pryor's bodyguard mm-hmm. uh, had an allegation that Paul Mooney, I guess, molested Richard Pryor's junior son, mm-hmm. Richard Pryor Jr. Thoughts on that? Well. First and foremost, some people ask me, you know, when I was on tour, you know, is Paul Mooney gay? And I mm-hmm. tell them like this, he ain't fucked me yet. So Not yet. Well, I hope not, you know. <laughs> I'm going to stop that from happening. He's <laughs> 79 years old and shit. You can fight him off. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, 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 can, I, can, I, I fought younger people off, motherfucker, okay? So, okay? okay. So, so now I'll go for that. So now, I'm kind of hearing the age was around 19 and 20 years old when this supposed to went down. You know, you know, yeah, that he wasn't a child. He wasn't like 12 years old, 10 years old when this, you know. So he was, was an adult. To, an adult. That doesn't mean you can't be raped or molested as an adult. I say that. I think anybody getting molested, that's whack. If Paul did that, that's some bullshit. Okay. Now, if he did that, it's also now. What I think was kind of lame was my man coming out with it. You know, the, the bodyguard. Mm-hmm. Richard Pryor Jr. hadn't said nothing about it. Maybe Richard Pryor Jr. didn't want anybody to know about it. You don't put some else on blast. Let him say it. Don't you do someone else's work, for, you know, that kind of work. That's not cool to me, man. You know, motherfucker going to keep his shit secret. And now he got to answer those questions. Now we can look at Richard Pryor Jr. Like, ah, you been fucked by, by Paul Mooney or accused of being fucked by Paul Mooney. He might be like, yo, man, that's why when they asked him, he's like, nah, you know, well, I don't know, something happened. Yeah. He, well, he, no, he like, kind of danced around it. Well, yeah, because he didn't want no one to know about it. So why would a bodyguard go put my man on blast? If you did some crazy shit, would you want somebody to, someone else to tell on your business? Well, here's the thing. Right, when you look at this situation, mm-hmm. and in 2019, it's hard to really answer this question, right? Because if you were to ask me, "Hey, were you molested by a man?" I would be like, "Hell no, no, absolutely not, okay. never happened." Point blank, period. Okay, sure. But we're also in a society these days where, like, the victims are being praised. You see what I'm saying? Like, being sure. the victim of something sure. Sure. now puts you on a, on a on a level that really was not there in previous sure, years. Sure, I could say. So by someone saying, yeah, it may have happened, I don't know whether it really did happen or maybe he's trying to get some publicity or some, you know... Um, well, then why wouldn't he come out and say it earlier? Why would you say, why would you say if, if, if you want the publicity, say, yeah, it happened. He fucked me. Yeah, he did. Why don't you say that? Yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a tough, if, it's a tough situation. But if you situation. want the publicity, you go rock hard with it. No, plan, no pun intended. But you go out with it. You know what I'm saying? I still don't want to, if you had got molested and I knew about it, why should I go around telling me, yo, Vlad got molested? When you, when you want to be like, let me say this shit. Let me, you know, now, now you got to answer those charges that something you didn't want. Would you look at me like, thank you for saying that, man. Good looking out. Put me on front street. That's not cool, bro. Uh, well, Paul Mooney's a legend. I mean, he used, yeah. to, he used to write for uh, Richard Pryor. That's what it, and that's what I said. He said he didn't write for him, so I don't know what portion of that is. But also, here's my thing: what are you looking for? What do you want from 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 Paul Mooney? He's 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 79 years old, senile, mm-hmm. you know, whatever. Dementia got dementia. Coming so so in. does he have dementia? Yeah, the dementia's kicking in on him and stuff like you know. So yeah. give me an example of of dementia with, with Paul um, Mooney. Like what kind of things would you see? He well, he's not really performing anymore, so his mind is not. He remembers to act like that. Okay. It'll come back a little bit with me. I know Paul Mooney since about 92, 1992. Oh, okay. So, you know, I used to watch him at the comedy store all the time. So I had to kind of, you know, what do you call it, re acclimate myself with him a couple of times. And, Paul, what's up, dude? Uh, this, that, and then he, now he knows me. So you have to kind of be around him a little more for him mm-hmm. to catch who you are and stuff like that. You know what I'm saying? So that he does remember you, but it has to, it's not from the rip, you walking through the door. You have to take a couple of things, be around him and so forth like that. And so he comes in and out. He'll remember some stuff and some things he won't remember like that. 
But again, he's 79 years old. I'm not saying if he did this shit, it's wrong. It is wrong. But then what, are, what, 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 what do you want? Let's say he did do it. What is the result from that? You want him to go to jail for the last two years of his life? I mean, look at Bill Cosby. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that was you want. Yeah. He's about, isn't Bill Cosby older? Probably so. I'm like, okay. I thought with the Bill Cosby thing, since he had that money, to me, I know this is my first thing, he'd start better giving the people some money. I'd give each one of them $2 million. I mean, if that's the case, it's sell out of court like that. At least, I mean, to see that man behind bars, I guess you could say, well, you're never too late to go to jail. Okay, but if that's what you want, that's fine. But I think when you're, like in your 80s, you know, I think, come on, man. You know. Well, I remember there, there was a, there was like a roast or something that happened oh, yeah, years yeah. ago. Mm -hmm. It was a roast. And a roast. Uh, this one comedian try to make some gay jokes mm -hmm. about Paul Mooney. Sure, sure. And Paul Mooney got up and just destroyed the guy. You know what? Remember what I'm talking about? I think about? it was a Paul Mooney roast on BET. It was kind of like a low budget. I think I, I didn't see Something it. Something like yeah. that. And somebody said that he was being gay. He got up, yeah, and, and, and got on him about it, yeah. So, yeah. so Paul Mooney has never admitted to being gay. Right, right. Well. But yeah. he also didn't. Well, I guess he kind of kind of did deny it. I mean, at least in the in the roast he did. But there's another roast that for Richard Pryor back in 19, maybe, I don't know, early, mid-70s, 77, 1977, you can look at YouTube, where Richard Pryor calls him Miss Thang. He talks about Paul Mooney's on the roast, you know, on the panel. He's like, yeah, look at old, like Miss Thang right there. But why'd you call him Miss Thang? So he might know some undercover stuff that he might have a little Well, sugar, wasn't you know? Richard Pryor bisexual? I guess once you fuck a person, man, once, you guess, you know, <laughs> ain't no turning back then, I guess. So he said he had sex with a man once before. Right. So once you go, once you go back door, you don't go back. <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know. I, like I I'm saying, so he said, know. you know, I don't know, you know. Well, you also got to understand, Paul Mooney grew up in a time where homosexuality was not embraced like it is in 2019. You know, like Lil Nas X has the right. biggest song in the world. Sure. He comes out and he's gay and everyone's like, oh, that's great. We love you even right. more now. Right. Paul Mooney... You know, being being gay back then would sure. really end your career. Sure. You see what I'm saying? So so right. he, he, he grew up with these types of thoughts, this type of environment. So I could see why if he is gay, he would not come out of the closet. Right. And at 79 right. years old, I mean, what do you have to prove to anybody? Right. Like, you know, if you had sex with men, then that's just what you did. And it's no, right. no one's business at this point. Right. Sure, sure. But you knowing him all these years, you've never seen him with a, with a man or with never. a boyfriend or... Nope. Nope, and I, I've been I've been around him, you know, you know, one on one, not in hotel rooms, like, but it was private talking to him and stuff like that. Never, no, no, never at all. Yeah, man. Well, I, I'm a huge fan. Yeah, me too. Uh, I mean, I, he, he's actually fan. my favorite comedian of all time. Really? Yeah, yeah. out of all Richard Pryor, everybody. I, I, I thought that. his humor was just sharp, and it's, if you listen to him, he just had a lot of, you know, and and, and he, he went out there and, and and he hung out there, he hung himself out there like Chappelle's doing now with that racism stuff that was rough. You know, it wasn't, Richard Pryor would do it nicely and do other jokes and stuff, but Paul Mooney would stay in that whole zone of racism, you know, and talk about how fucked up he was. Oh, yeah. That I was mean, a hell of a uh, thing to do, man. I mean, on the yeah. Chappelle show, he, oh, had, he had a skit, oh. Ask a Black Guy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Negro Damas. Yeah, you know, he wrote Homie the Clown. Oh, know? he did? Yeah, he wrote Homie the Clown, yeah. I mean, I, I remember there was that one skit where I think these two white girls, like, uh, reviewing films, and it was like, The Last Samurai featuring Tom Cruise. Right, and he was like, "Hated it, hated it." Uh, I'm gonna make a movie called "The Last N Word Alive," starring Tom Hanks. Oh, wow. <laughs> like, wow. Wow. I remember that one. Oh yeah, right, right. right. Yeah, he, he went in, man. Yeah, okay. um, oh, he yeah. went in. Oh, yeah. So, but you know, molestation or rape right. at any point is fucked up. It and is. I hope it didn't happen. Right. And you know, Richard Pryor Jr. If he wants to talk about it, he has he has a platform at this point to do well, it. Well, now he does. You know, that, now he yeah, does. Yeah, but I wouldn't have wanted to be put out like that if I, you know, if I was trying to keep it a secret. But I think that guy's some, trying to buy, sell a book or something. So, hey, you know, got, everybody's doing what they're doing. Shit, it is what it is. Well, yeah, I mean, dementia shit is, uh, that's hard, man. Yeah, when yeah, you, when yeah, you, yeah. When you start losing your ability to really think, you know, properly. Right, it's, it's right, a tough right, one. right, right, right. It's like I said, one. if he did it, it's fucked up. But to see him, like, going down now, like, wow, man. But, you know, we all live to a certain extent. The longer we live, we all going to run into some of that. So you have a new uh, stand-up special called Make America Mixed Again. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, I got, got to. Which well, I'm a, mixed because I'm black and white. Right. It's, it's a play right. off of MAGA. Right, right, right. right, right. <laughs> <laughs> I think we need to come back together again, man. We need to talk about it. Get this together, man. There's too much separation right now. Right? Yeah. Too much, man. You know, And, it's, and I, I like to show the parts that we all have some of the same problems, man. We really do. We really do. At the end of the day, we all going through some of the same shit. We're depressed. We're scared. We're jealous. We're happy. We're mm -hmm. greedy. All that, man. It's the same. It's just... We just feel like with this guy, he has separated us to be on this side, and you got to be on this side, you got to be on this side. And at the end of the day, we all want 
to just have a decent life. Yep. You know, it's a decent life, man. I don't care if you're black, white, Asian, Mexican, or whatever. You want a decent life, man. And he's just throwing it into you either on this side or that side. And I want to make a you know a, company, a union you know to come back again. <laughs> well, that's what it is. Well, listen, Pierre, yeah. man, appreciate uh, you coming in. Uh, congrats you on everything you put together, man. I, I know Hollywood it. is a tough place. Stand up is a tough place. Yeah, yeah. yeah and you know. uh, you've been doing it now for decades now. Decades, man. Decades. You know? A lot of people haven't seen me. They saw me missing for a while. They're like, "Where you been at?" But I was behind the scenes, man, filming stuff, making my own stuff. Sometimes you gotta make your own shit, man. You don't don't wait for Hollywood. I tell anybody out there. Do, don't wait for Hollywood. Make it yourself. You wait for them to put you on something, man. You might wait a long time, and I ain't gonna have that happen. That's what it is, man. Looking yeah. forward to everything you got coming up. Appreciate it, brother. Peace. Thank you.